Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, featuring speakers from our 2017 event. This podcast features Fred Gregg from Avondale Seeds, Jason Voot from Field to Field Agronomy Inc., and Lynn Sweeney from Richardson International as they discuss managing wheat classes profitably. Thank you, everyone. Our panelists can sit. We're not, I don't think we'll make them stand or do exercises along the way. Uh, I appreciate people, uh, people sticking around here. Um, welcome on behalf of Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers Association uh, to be kind of your, your host and uh, sponsor and, and moderator for this discussion. Uh, might not be quite as uh, lively and controversial as the last topic, um, but still uh, trying to follow a change that's taking place in the marketplace and very consistent with what we feel the responsibility of Manitoba Wheat and Barley is about finding profitability and ensuring that we are uh, investing in leadership, in research, market development, and communication that continues to drive profitability for cereal production. So with that, we hope that this is kind of a timely issue, that there are these changes in classification of wheat varieties. Uh, there's some uncertainties around that, and there's a, different, a few different perspectives to come at that to start thinking about what that may or may not mean for your farm. Uh, so the creation of this uh, Canadian Northern Hard Red class um, has some considerations that we, we want to discuss. Um, there are, there's, a, there's some immediate changes and then there's some reclassification of some of the, the, uh, uh, the hard red varieties, that are, or the Canadian Western Red Spring varieties. You gotta get, get all the acronyms right yeah. these days. Um, now those, but from our understanding, those changes were really, really came from two, two specific drivers. One is that we had some classes of wheat that didn't fit well anywhere, and there was the creation of an interim class that, that was just interim, uh, so there needed a home. And the other, that a couple of years ago, we had, some, we had some real pressure on Canadian quality for gluten strength that was, uh, it was seen as compromising the Canadian quality standard for our hard red spring wheats. So those two, two kind of things kind of drove this, dis, this discussion to, uh, and I, we won't go this in, in detail, but these, these uh, interim classes of, or interim varieties of Faller, Prosper, and Elgin needed a home. And now the projection is by 2018, there's a number of hard red spring classes that will fit into this new classification. Well, and there's a review going on for other varieties that over the next two years will be reviewed and, the, and there's the expectation there'll be at least two years notice. So with, with those things to consider, let's think about this from the, from the uh, back of the napkin farm practical, uh, what am I thinking about view. Let's think about it from the yield quality, uh, agronomic potential, yield potential point of view and let's have a run at it from the marketer, uh, world market logistics experience. Uh, and, and out of that, hopefully we'll garner some ideas about where uh, this may or may not present some profit pr profitability options for you. We've asked each of the presenters to stay within a 10 to max 15 minutes, and that leaves us sort of a 20 minute summary time here to wrap up by, uh, by noon. Um, for each presenter, I asked a few questions just to kind of prime to make sure that these things came together. Uh, we'll begin with Fred Gregg. His introduction uh, came earlier from our, um, from our host here. Um, we, we asked Fred because we understand he's a, he's a plain talk and pragmatic uh, fellow that uh, I've got to know. And we asked the question to say, from a farmer's point of view, what are your initial thoughts on what might influence your variety decisions? What are some of the assumptions that you're beginning with about, uh, about yield and price difference? What is it that you think you still need to discover? And how you, will you continue to kind of proceed to figure this thing out from your own farm point of view? So I welcome Fred. <laughs> oh, thank you. Did that discreetly. Yeah, that was good. Which button is it? Forward? Oh, yeah, yep. Look at that. Thank you very much, everyone and thanks for the kind words. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to be clear that the Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers are sponsoring this uh, 
panel discussion and um, I will be speaking there my own personal opinions uh, so they won't reflect upon Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers Association at all. Um, with most things I do, I always have to have a disclaimer or sign an insurance waiver of some kind. And after you know this previous presentation, I want to let everybody know that I think I'm carbon neutral, so there shouldn't be any tax implications on it for me. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to add a little bit to what, what Brent said um, from, from the farmer's standpoint, why I think it, it came about. The CNHR class uh, came about because there was a request amongst producers that wanted to access, to be able to grow legally some U.S. higher yielding, lower quality wheats. Uh, they were grown in the northern tier states. This would allow Canadian producers to compete in those world markets uh, that didn't require CWRS quality and therefore price. Uh, the variety registration system was changed to firstly add the new class of the CNHR, um, which better reflected the quality of the class. Um, if you remember at that time, we had a general purpose class as well. Uh, which, which was of lower quality. Equal yield, but lower quality. So um, it was felt that, that by having a new class, it would allow them to, to extract that value out of the marketplace for producers as well. So secondly, after that, which, which Brent spoke to, uh, there was some narrowing of those quality parameters amongst all of the wheat classes. Um, mostly with respect to um, gluten strength and protein levels. So this reclassification of the existing varieties has and will continue to cause some confusion in the marketplace and will, will have marketing concerns for producers. The Fall or Prosper Elgins are U.S. Dark Northerns. Harvest, which is a CWRS from Canada, and AC Foremost is a CPS Red are all in now in the CNHR class. However, they do have very different milling qualities and end uses. So on our farm, we're gonna approach the CNHR class as an IP or identity preserved variety types. So before we will consider growing it, we're gonna make sure that our grain marketers, we're gonna be in close contact with them so that we all understand uh, what we're growing and how it'll be marketed and where we can market it. So the second question was assumptions on comparing the CWRS and the CNHR class. So to make it a little more accurate, because there is such a difference in quality in this class, I just compared the Fall or Prosper and our CWRS class. I feel that better reflects and allows producers to make some decisions. Um, using uh, Manit Seed Manitoba 2017 data, without permission, I might add, but I used to name that. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Sh shamelessly borrowed. <laughs> shamelessly borrowed, there you go. <laughs> so based on that, there is a yield advantage to the fall or prospers over the high yielding popular CWRSs of about 20%. And if you use a 1% protein discount, uh, there's about a 16% price discount. So, so I guess if you've got a 20% yield advantage and only a 16% price discount, it looks pretty good. Um, the other thing I did was, um, in our area, we've, we've had some excess moisture f for quite a period of time and we've had less than average growing conditions. So I, I, I created a table from the Melita site, which, which also shows it was a little less productive that year, but it, it was also very similar. Um, there was a 15% yield advantage, protein difference was the same about the percent protein, and the price therefore was also at a 16% discount. So at the back of the envelope or napkin, um, just to add some numbers to that, I prepared these tables. Um, the top one is province-wide, 
from Seed Manitoba, and the bottom table is just specific to Melita, so all the varieties weren't in it. And I just, just used the cash daily price from our local grain marketer, who actually happens to have a representative here today, so that was, <laughs> that was lucky. So AAC Brandon is one of the most popular hard red spring wheats. Uh, last year the protein content was 14.2, so if I price that out, I think it was Thursday of last week, we get a gross income per acre of 425.10. A new variety is, is AAC Cameron. It was the highest yielding hard red spring wheat last year and protein was virtually similar on that price point. So then we looked at Faller, which was the highest of the, those three. Um, one point protein lower, price was 562, so that was 449.60, which is basically a wash. Um, so um, they are higher producing higher productive varieties if the conditions persist. And I just wanted to let everybody know that if you don't get ideal growing conditions or better than average growing conditions, they still perform well. So in, in Melita, they didn't have Brandon in their trial, but Cameron was 50 bushels an acre, protein was a bit lower, and the price was 634, works out to 317 an acre. Faller also yielded a bit less, but it was still 59% one point protein lower 12, at 12%, 542, so again it's a wash at 319.78. So back to my notes. So some other considerations I guess that I felt producers should be aware of if they're going to grow these varieties uh, the, the, there's no reason not to, because we see economically they're going to return us the same. Um, on our farm, as we're seed growers, we've never really driven the protein model because I get paid in bushels when I sell them to producers. I don't, don't get paid in protein, so we're trying to maximize bushels, not protein. So luckily Jason's here to answer all of those questions for you later. So if you're going to be comparing the two, I think the other thing to remember is there are some IP contracts available and Warburton is an example for, for Faller, Prosper, those types. A lot of the companies are starting to come to the table. And the other thing to bear in mind is, is I didn't use the highs or the lows. This is just the spot price. So there will be opportunities throughout the year to, to contract either of those variety or, or class types at a higher or lower level. So I think um, agronomically there will be decisions that we need to, as producers, assess. Um, there are fusarium tolerances and DOM level production, standability. Um, and the other thing is, is discounts. Um, when we're growing a, a class that's a little lower acres, I'm guessing it's in that 15 to 20 percent range is where it's been traveling. Do you maybe know that, Lynn? In terms of the CNHR varieties? Yeah, compared, compared to, to the, to of the, of the spring wheat classes. On average. On yeah. Average. So we're already starting with a smaller pool to try to blend into. And if you get off grade, once you get down into the feed, you know, we see another 9% price discount, which I think was why the old um, interim class was developed, because the GP feed class didn't have any any price premium over straight free varieties. And if you happen to hit a high bomb this year, it, it's, yeah, I don't even want to tell you what that price is. And the other thing I did check on with crop insurance is um, Fall or Prosper will still be insured as a feed variety from a yield standpoint, but they have, uh, same as last year, the grade guarantee is a number two CNHR. So uh, the next question um, Brent asked was, what do we see the, where do I see the advantage in, in this class? And, and where the, I think the key advantage is going to be, it's another opportunity to have a different pricing option still participating in a cereal or in a wheat, 
with we're already stretching our rotations. Uh, in past, we were trying to do that with winter wheat, and successfully so. It's just in these excess moisture years, uh, they've performed, um, they haven't performed quite as well in excess moisture, and the spring wheats have had a little advantage that way. Another advantage I see is that there is some more north-south movement with the CNHRs um, versus the east-west, so, so that should be positive to producers. Um, I'm not sure how much of that is already reflected in the price, and, and maybe uh, Lynn can speak to that later too. Um, the other thing I found out, which, which is quite interesting, is the if you can bump your premiums in each of these two classes, you get paid exactly the same. They're, they're not giving you more money for a CWRS half point of protein over the CNHRs, the, oh, sorry, uh, the fall or prospers. If it's 40 cents on a CWRS, it's 40 cents on a faller, which was good to see. Um, I've already spoke to the off-grade. I'm wondering that probably Lynn can speak to that a little bit too. Um, so finally, the last question was, how, how, what are we gonna do on our farm? And I think um, we've never grown faller or prosper yet. We have grown the, the GP classes before, the, the high yielding. Um, so I'm quite confident that those yield numbers will come. Um, we will closely watch and see what contract levels can be obtained. And if there's a premium on, you know, we're not scared at all to recommend that to our producers. Um, on my farm, seed decisions rule all. So until I see enough of a demand, it's easier for me to buy in a bit of pedigreed faller to sell to my customers. So that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll scoot along, but I want to, uh, again, introduce uh, Jason here, who I've known for several years, and I don't think you'll find a more intense uh, field scout after 20 years of uh, being in the field. Jason sees all the sunsets and all the sunrises uh, in, in the way he does business. And I asked him the quick questions about what about yield potential and major, with the major varieties in the classes, uh, maybe agronomic strategies by class or by, by variety are the regions that are going to lend themselves more likely than others for some of the varieties and what work needs to be done. So in the 12 magic minutes, he's going to give her. He should know better to give the podium to an agronomist <laughs> and uh, delegate four slides only. I may just stand here. Yeah, you might have to give me the hook. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone here this morning. And like Brent said, my focus is going to be mainly looking at the, uh, um, the agronomic sides of the, uh, the different classes of wheat. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail as far as every single class, because as you can see, there's nine different classes. This is a bit of an outlook or a look at some of the individual uh, kernel sizes and uh, quality and what they look like, just to kind of give you a bit of an idea of what we're talking about. Obviously, the ones we're going to look at mainly are going to be that the first two that you see there, and I'll talk a little bit briefly about the uh, CPSR ones as well, because that has, at least in my geography, in that uh, west central side of the uh, Red River Valley, from Fannistel Elm Creek down to Winkler Morden, that's gained a lot of popularity in the last couple of years. So as far as, you know, specifically looking at yield potential of the different classes, again, I'm just going to focus on, you know, a comparison, just like Fred was saying, between the hard red spring wheat or the uh, CWRS and the new dark northern. And just, just for people's interest, there has been already a lot of research done in the U.S., like mainly in University of Minnesota, uh, through individuals like Joachim Wiersma there, North Dakota State with Dave Franzen, and others like him, Joel Ransom, where they've actually looked at the uptake, the kind of uptake of nitrogen that goes into these uh, longer season, higher yielding varieties like these dark northerns, like a faller versus a hard red spring. So there is some data out there. I was just going to give you a quick example of that and uh, you know, why, what contributes to that increased yield that Fred was talking about. For example, if you look at faller, um, it uses more plant nitrogen more efficiently to produce grain yield than a hard red spring like, like a Glen. And that was just 
the variety that they use in that particular form of research. Glen, as far as a, a spring wheat, uh, uses plant nitrogen more efficiently to produce grain nitrogen or protein. And that's what you typically see between these different classes. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, these uh, higher yielding varieties tend to take up nitrogen long past flowering, more so than what a spring wheat will do. And they also, um, but they don't share it back into the seed as far as uh, building protein as much. Whereas a hard red spring variety like a Glen stops taking up nitrogen, not much past flowering, but what it does is it holds that nitrogen more within the plant and moves it better within the plant to build that protein later on. So there are actual genetic um, agronomic interactions that are happening that influence why we're seeing these higher yields. So that's just a quick brief look at it. Um, so like Fred was saying, we are seeing these uh, tendencies to see 15 to 20 percent higher yield depending on the kind of environment you get. However, what you do notice though is there is more to my last point, more newer genetics coming from the hard red spring or the Canada Western red spring variety side of things as far as breeding goes in the last couple of years versus the others. And I think what you'll see with that is maybe that, at this point anyways, maybe that, uh, that yield difference might shrink over time. So switching it to some agronomic strategies for yield and protein, there's a lot of different things to look at. Just to keep in mind, I built a lot of this from some of the uh, current research that's going on, sponsored by the wheat and barley growers and working with Manitoba Agriculture and their on-farm research network, as well as just talking to a number of producers, not only in the Red River Valley, but also in the um, western part of the province, because I get sometimes the blinders on when being in the Red River Valley, I realize the world doesn't end at Portage La Prairie. It <laughs> goes past that, so bear with me on that. But, Previous rule of thumb has always been two and a half pounds of nitrogen per bushel of spring wheat for yield and protein. So if you haven't been doing that already, that's something you need to look at. However, um, we need to look at how this plays into Manitoba. Current research that's being done, like I mentioned, is trying to develop a formula that's more specific to our Manitoba growing conditions as far as how do we fertilize, specifically nitrogen, to get yield and protein um, out of our current hard red springs or, you know, these, the new classes like the dark northern or the CPSR. And so some of the things being looked at is, you know, nitrogen rate and timing. Uh, one of the biggest concerns with these higher yielding varieties is, in some cases, sustainability and environmental influence there. So lodging. And we know that outside of uh, plant growth regulators, nitrogen is a way to manage lodging. And that is being done. So split applications looking at timing is being utilized to help manage that. Another thing to look at are, you know, some of the, or some of the research is looking at comparing the upfront front loading of nitrogen versus uh, some of these efficiency products like ESN and what contribution they have to protein. And then one of the other things that's uh, gaining a little, a lot of popularity that I have worked with and even specifically with Brent all the way back to 2012 is this post anthesis or PAN nitrogen model for increasing protein. The system where you apply um, 30 pounds of actual nitrogen through UAN, 10 gallons, mixed with 10 gallons of water, sprayed on the wheat head post anthesis or just after flowering has completed. Um, there is all sorts of things that go along with that as far as visual, sometimes phyto to the to leaves, but there is a over 80% probability that you're going to get half to upwards of even a percent bump in protein. And we've seen that uh, in most cases that uh, giving us that bump. So the interaction there, Brent also wanted me to talk a little bit about disease and how that plays into it. Fusarium is still a concern obviously in the Red River Valley. It's a concern on most people's mind again after this year. But it's becoming more an increasing problem for the rest of the province as well into that uh, western Manitoba and parkland regions, especially as they start experimenting or looking at, as Fred said, some of these other, these other higher yielding varieties and how to manage those. So, you know, to, to that question, it's not necessarily a class issue, but a variety specific one, because you can have strong varieties to a fusarium tolerance within different classes. It's not just that these higher yielding ones are gonna be better or, or worse. It, comes back to the actual genetics of that specific variety. So something you have to keep in mind. Climatic regions, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. 
I think you know most of these newer yielding, higher yielding varieties in this dark northern class can pretty much fit in most areas. But one thing a producer will have to look at too is just making sure they give reference or look back at, uh, at uh, guidance or guides like the seed guide to make sure that maturity fits too, that we're not pushing something too late. Um, I'm not a grower I specifically work with, but I remember on Twitter seeing a grower talk about, this was I think two years ago, they planted, uh, they had some drown out down in that southeastern part of the province and they had to plant, they planted Pasteur uh, GP weed at the time um, on the end of June. And uh, so I remember him showing pictures like well into the end of September and this stuff was still almost grass green. And so I'm not sure how well that turned out for him. Not something of a, maybe a great decision, but uh, I mean, it, everything has its limits is what I'm trying to get at there. Fusarium continues to be a prominent concern, like I said. Um, that safe haven of western Manitoba, I think, is uh, starting to become less safe. Although there are still growers I was even talking to yesterday that still take a flag leaf fungicide approach to disease control and didn't actually do anything this past year on uh, uh, the T3 or the early anthesis timing, and they still are number two red spring wheat. So I think you have to look at your individual area, look at your risk maps, all of that to play into it. Foliar diseases, I think too. A key thing is to really look at the foliar disease packages on those varieties as well as far as their tolerance to stem rust, leaf rust, um, those type of things, tan spots, your, your foliar diseases, especially if you're growing them in tight rotations and under reduced tillage. You want to be looking at that as something important. And then as far as the final slide, just to wrap up, this is, a, I guess, more of a agronomist wish list, but also in conversation with, you know, growers that I work with, as well as also um, some of the other research we've seen in other areas that I know the wheat and barley growers and Manitoba agriculture representatives are in contact with. But some things like variety or even class by nitrogen fertility interactions under, under different environmental conditions. Nitrogen use efficiencies of a variety. I mentioned earlier in a couple slides ago about that difference between faller and uh, so a, a dark northern versus a Canada western red spring as far as nitrogen uptake and efficiency. I think we need to see more of that work done here. Influence of water use and timing. We're seeing more, you know, water, more rainfall in, in different areas where they're not getting as or haven't had that kind of rainfall to utilize. So. Is this an opportunity for them to take advantage of some of these other varieties to, uh, to grow in those geographies? And then lastly, um, just looking at determining recommendations for a variety by soil type. So just some things, I mean, there's a lot of a, lot of a wish list, some is already being looked at today, but uh, some things I think we're gonna have to look at more closely now that we have these different classes. Thank you, Jason, appreciate it. Um, to to uh, complete the trio uh, is Lynn Sweeney, and uh, uh, I had the pleasure of working on a working group with Lynn, and I, uh, I I really appreciated the sort of transparency and the straight talk about well, this is how the trade has to deal with this stuff, uh, and I thought it was really instructive from a producer point of view uh, to have that much clarity about how. Uh, uh, about some of the, the complications and the logistics around how um, this new class may be received. So I asked the questions around, can you explain how the trade's going to approach this new, uh, this new class? What are the things that might drive the price spreads uh, in the marketplace? W will this break down into not just class but, but um, sub, sub variety um, kind of markets? and what is it that producers should be most aware of and how they make decisions. So I appreciate Lynn being here with us today. Thanks, thanks for having me, uh, Brent, and, and uh, thanks uh, for allowing us the opportunity to share a bit of our story today as it relates to a marketer through this uh, wheat modernization uh, reclassification system change. I have two disclaimers to make. <laughs> this morning before I start. I'm here representing Richardson International, so I may not share the exact uh, purview of the rest of the industry as it relates to handlers and exporters. And the second is, if I make any merchandising or marketing faux pas, um, I can do so because my husband is a canola trader. 
uh, I mean, I'm, and I'm a lowly uh, quality assurance person, so I get to make those <laughs> okay. mistakes. Um, so as it relates to wheat and marketing through the wheat classification or reclassification modernization system, just to touch on Brent's earlier points, um, our experience with this reclassification or modernization uh, comes on the heels of us taking over the merchandising aspect of wheat and Durham uh, in Canada from the single desk seller and upon um, our introduction to that part of the business, um, no longer just being a handler on behalf of the Canadian Wheat Board, we learned very quickly that there had been a history uh, that it hadn't just popped up of a lessening or a, a weakening of strength as it relates to functionality of wheat that we were selling into the global market over time. And because of that, there was an impetus to help reduce that or alleviate that over time. Um, we heard that we had a need or a desire to want to protect Canada's reputation as a consistent supplier of quality wheat products, high protein quality wheat products to the world, and we really wanted to protect that. And in order to do so, uh, there was a desire to reassign varieties that, that were by nature of uh, quality assessment uh, determined to no longer fit into particularly the CWRS and CPS classes. Um, albeit they had reasonable functionality in a lot of cases, um, they didn't necessarily present with the same types of quality and functionality attributes as some of the other CWS or CPS varieties, um, but we knew that they were better than a general purpose variety, uh, and we wanted to see if there was an opportunity for us to extract value. And lastly, obviously, we're very much in support uh, within our organization as not only a handler and exporter of Canadian wheat, but also as a partner with Canadian growers in establishing um, their farms and their seed decisions and their crop input decisions as well. So wanting to make sure that we could maintain access to the future commercialization of varieties that ne didn't necessarily meet the CWS or the CPS classes, but still fit well into the agronomics of uh, Western Canadian farms. So just to uh, kind of debunk some of the myths around what it is that the global wheat demand wants or needs or expects from us in Canadian wheat, uh, it's really three very, very simple things. They're looking for consistent functionality, so consistent quality and con consistent performance in the product that we sell to them. So they want that wheat to behave the same way each time we, shall, we sell them a cargo, each time they take uh, a portion of a cargo into their mills, into their factories, into their facilities or manufacturing plants, they want it to basically perform the same way or reasonably the same way without having to make any major changes to their manufacturing systems. They also want consistent supply. They want consistent supply not only throughout the crop year, but they want consistent supply year over year. So they don't want to have ebbs and flows in our ability to supply that consistent quality or the consistent performing product. And lastly, they come to Canada for high protein wheat. It's no secret that there is a, uh, a great deal of mid-protein wheat available in the world, and Canada is seen as a market that presents with good opportunities for them to get their arms around high protein wheat. So as it relates to the current class and CNHR being created, to Fred's earlier comments, to allow for a place marker for particular varieties like Faller and Prosper, um, and Elgin only today. We have some general intelligence as it relates to being uh, quality assurance professionals and, and uh, milling and baking um, experts to some degree in uh, our handling and export systems within Richardson. So we kind of have an idea how Faller and Prosper typically behave, the kinds of functionality attributes they bring with them. Um, and because of that, we've been able to, where opportunistic, tap into some merchandising or marketing streams where we can funnel the current CNHR class into. And a couple of examples are as a blend today to CWS, when we're selling into the US market, which you touched on earlier, we generally, uh, for the most of you probably well recognize that we don't really sell a Canadian grade anywhere we sell wheat in the world nowadays. We sell specifications, so we ship to specifications. Um, so we sell what we would say is equivalent to a number two northern uh, grade standard or quality parameters into the U.S. And what we'll do is because Faller and Prosper are northern varieties out of the U.S., they're well recognized, uh, understood, we will then look to use CWRS and the protein within the CWRS, the functionality within the CWRS, to allow us to basically uh, prop up the CNHR to the extent that it's palatable 
for manufacturers in the U.S. system to use them in combination. What happens in that circumstance is it does limit us to the extent of the volume of the CNHR class that we can put into the CWS deliveries, but nonetheless it allows us to at least provide some market access opportunities to our grower partners, um, albeit at a discounted price to CWS. The other option we have had uh, an opportunity to take advantage of is as, as a freight play on larger export cargoes to other countries around the world where we will um, convince, um, sometimes persuade <laughs> customers to take a hold of CNHR uh, within a CWRS cargo. Um, in that case, we have to really understand how that CNHR is going to function, so we do a lot of analytical work ahead of time so that we understand the milling and baking attributes of the CNHR that we're going to place in that hold um, because it does still have to have a reasonably good protein and reasonably good functionality in order for them to agree to that. And then again, we do that at a discounted price to CNA, or CWRS. And lastly, uh, to the earlier comments, we do partner with some single end use customers with limited demand uh, for the likes of individual varieties, i.e. Prosper, for example. Um, and there, we really are at the mercy of that customer wanting to stay married to that variety for any extended period of time. So we hope that happens, although we do run the risk of them switching to alternate classes or varieties as they go through their product development cycles uh, with their end use products or intended use products as well. And in those cases, we do obviously participate in those markets as a discount to CWS typically as well. So as it relates to how does the current CW or CNHR class meet our global wheat demands. If we go back to the three simple objectives or desires or wants of the global customers, from a consistent functionality perspective, consistent quality and consistent performance today, with just typically the faller and prosper varieties making up the class, um, they aren't significantly dissimilar by functionality to each other. They are um, pretty close in nature of how they will behave within the milling process. And so um, we know about that, and because we know about that, we combine them with the CWS and discount the price for, in order for them to be generally palatable into certain markets. So from a consistency perspective, we could argue today that CNHR delivers that. From a consistent supply perspective, so throughout the year and year over year, uh, unfortunately for us, not by volume is our answer to that. So there's not enough of the varieties grown in the context that allows us to be able to say we can offer this on a consistent basis throughout the crop year and year over year. And then ultimately as it relates to high protein, at best they're mid-protein wheat varieties, um, which the global wheat market is typically fairly flush with and, and in most cases or a lot of cases um, they can get their arms around mid-protein wheat from a better uh, freight advantage position than Canada. As it relates to uh, CNHR, fast forward, when the class takes on a real different look, August 1st, 2018, and if you haven't already visited the, I'll give the Canadian Grain Commission a plug here, <laughs> their website, um, you can do so, and there's a, there's a few really good uh, articles or, or, or periodicals or points in there that will outline the changes that you can expect to see going forward August 1st, 2018, but the long and short of it is, as of that date, you're going to see not only the likes of the Faller and Prosper varieties um, join the CNHR class, you're also going to see varieties like Lillian and Harvest and Unity, the three uh, varieties who have um, had to take uh, most of the brunt of the challenges with the strength of the CWS class, uh, as, long, as well as 21 other varieties, which we really don't have a lot of individual intelligence on as it relates to the parameters, the functionality, the, the quality around milling and baking and how they're going to behave. So, and keep in mind, these varieties have been moved into the CNH, CNHR class because they have been deemed by assessment, quality assessment, to be weaker than the CWRS varieties. So as a blend to CWRS to sell into Canada going forward, fast forward 2018, we no longer have the assurance of understanding and knowing Faller and Prosper and its behavior. We have all these other varieties. We have much lower protein varieties now being included in the class. We have new combinations of varieties as to how they're going to get delivered in Western Canada. We might get a whole bunch of harvest in one place and no harvest and a whole bunch of Prosper in another place and we might get something completely different somewhere else. So we really, at the end of the day, don't have a lot of consistency in the collection of the class going forward. As a freight play, again, taking a single hold, those that want mid-protein uh, and, and good average quality varieties 
Um, we're likely not going to be able to do that going forward. And arguably, we could still continue to pull Prosper out of the system, really no different than we do today at the same kind of risk level we had before. So, you know, does the demand, the wheat, global wheat demand at August 1st, 2018, get met by the new look of the new CNHR uh, class? Uh, from a consistent functionality perspective, we're saying likely not. It's going to be, quite frankly, all over the map. We're going to have multiple varieties, multiple functionality. Um, it's not necessarily going to meld all together and blend all together very nicely. The consistent supply, uh, our position is likely by volume. There could be enough uh, of the combined varieties within the class. Uh, but functionality aside, it would just be that. It would be volume. And then, ultimately, from a protein perspective again, uh, at best, you're going to have protein all over the map within the class, typically with the varieties that are getting placed into the class. At best, we're going to reach a, a mid-protein wheat uh, opportunity, and again, we're competing against other option origin globally for pieces of that market. So at the end of the day, you know, we ask ourselves, how is this going to sort out? You know, will there be more CNHR wheat by volume? Will there be any differences in the demand? Will there be increased or changes to the demand by then that we haven't anticipated? Will demand or pricing, if it stays the same as it is today, uh, limit the class and will growers make their seating decisions based on that? Will the class over time, once people recognize and, and we figure out that there maybe isn't merchandising plays for certain aspects of it, uh, shorten or shortlist itself by nature of, of, of growers making choices around seeding? And will we end up maybe over time, post-2018, uh, with a class that looks something similar to today, where you have less varieties within the class and maybe they behave more similarly and we come back to maybe a, a prosper fall or situation? Not sure. Or will we, over time, will there be a further development of more IP programs? We're not seeing it today, but we're not saying it may not, may not happen. Uh, where we might just pull individual varieties uh, itself from the class. So uh, I don't have a lot of answers for you, probably have as many questions as you have about how the class is going to sort itself out over time, but that just kind of gives you a, a merchandising or a marketing perspective of that. Thank you very much. Are we up uh, on this microphone? Where's my, there, there's my friend. Thank you very much, Lynn. We, we've, and they have been an exceptionally well-behaved panelist. It's hard to say that you can actually get people to work within the time frames that we've given. Full points. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at Manitoba Ag Days 2018 from January 16th to 18th.